Well, thank you for the invitation. It's always exciting to talk about a technology that actually completely changes my life. Um, as a informatician, having ultra long reads makes assembly a lot easier. Let's see. So I want to start off with one of my favorite things, high molecular weight DNA. So Taco's right, high molecular weight DNA is really the way to go here. And we do it old school. So we go back to just an old gel, CTAB extraction, very straightforward methodology. And what we look for is the smile. So the smile tells us high molecular weight DNA. Right next to that smile is also, what we thought was high molecular weight DNA um, by all other measures, but when you're running out on gel, it looks a little bit more fragmented. It actually produces a, still you get reads that are 50, 20 KB, but not 100 to uh, 800 KB. So for the data that I'm going to tell you about today, we have a very specific um, recipe or way that we do things. In general, we um, do CTAB extraction. Uh, we don't do any uh, fragmentation, so it's actually really great to see other people and how they do fragmentation and the results that they get. Um, we do do an FPE cleanup, um, which we find actually has a big effect on uh, the quality of the reads that come out. Um, and basically, at this point, we always do 1D library prep. So we stick to that in terms of doing whole genome sequencing. So our work really started on whole genomes when we had this epiphany about a year ago that we were getting the same type of data or even better on the Oxford nanopore compared to our uh, RS2. And so what I'm showing you here is basically just a, um, a quality versus length plot of one smart cell versus one flow cell. And this is Arabidopsis thaliana, which is the model um, plant, which has a 150 megabase genome. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But the first thing that I noticed that the quality was actually higher on the flow cells that um, we were running with Oxford. In addition, we were getting these very long reads. And because of these very long reads, it made a huge difference in um, the assemblies that we were getting. What I want to tell you about today, though, is a very specific study that we did. Even though Arabidopsis is in a large genome at 150 megabases, there was still an outstanding question as to one aspect of uh, the biology of Arabidopsis. And that was specifically um, if you transform Arabidopsis or insert genes into Arabidopsis, for either expressing a gene of interest or knocking out genes, what did those insertions actually look like? And actually, up until now, we really didn't have the technology to start looking at that because what we did realize were that these insertions were really long. So Agrobacterium um, is a bacteria that basically inserts DNA and it does it randomly. Usually there's many more than one insert, um, which has been shown, but really the architecture of those inserts were not known. So uh, we went ahead and sequenced a couple tDNA lines. What I'm showing you here is actually the reference genome of Arabidopsis. We basically, this is one flow cell, it took us four days to do. Um, that includes pr DNA prep, running it, assembly, polishing. Um, this assembly is polished using aluminaries. We do use the Minimap um, process, so Mini-ASM, um, to get the assembly. What I'm showing you here is basically chromosome arms of Arabidopsis. So full contig chromosome arms. The only thing that doesn't assemble here are the centromeres. And the reason that the centromeres don't assemble is that they're 100% identical 178 base pair repeats. And they go on for megabases. I have the reads, and I even have 100, 200 KB reads that span the uh, centromeres, but they won't assemble. So this is extremely encouraging. Um, when we saw this, this is exciting, and we thought, okay, well, we should apply this technology to our tDNA lines. So what I'm showing you is um, the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis, and each chromosome of the reference or the parental plant is actually lined up against two different tDNA lines. Um, they're named Salk and Sale, but um, 
They're just two different ways that they are made. Um, what I want to highlight is that we identified several different things that were really unusual. One, we found um, translocations and inversions, which we thought we might see, but until you have these long read technologies, you wouldn't actually be able to see those in the genome. We also found many more insertions than we thought we actually knew were in there based on PCR-based methods. So we identified additional insertions. So what did they look like? And this, this part really got us pretty excited. Um, so I'm just showing you two. These are just examples. And even though we have extremely long reads, we did find one that was uh, 206 KB that we weren't able to assemble through. And the reason we knew it was 206 KB is that we also did bio nanomaps to cover this. So we know the, the, the size of it, but we couldn't actually assemble it. And the reason we couldn't assemble it is that it's basically the insert repeated over and over again. So even though this genome is small, when you insert these repetitive cassettes, it makes them extremely hard to assemble. So this took, um, I think, two days. This line took two days using Minimap, Mini-ASM, and all the different polishing steps. It ran for over a week on Canu. So even though this is a small genome, these repeats really impact that. I also want to point out, though, that we did resolve some of the insertions. So there were smaller ones. If they were around 50, uh, 30 to 50 KB, we were able to resolve them. So that was pretty exciting. And, and that gave us an idea of what does the architecture look like as we're putting these new inserts into plants. Um, so I want to tell you about a slightly different story. We also sequenced lots of larger genomes. Um, but this genome was actually sort of interesting. So this is giant kelp. And as a person who lives in Southern California and surfs every day, this is the stuff that gets in my way when I surf. <laughs> However, it's actually ecologically very important, and it's an indicator of the health of the ocean. Um, these plants are huge, um, on the order of giant trees, um, but in the ocean. So uh, we, we basically have set out to sequence the genome, but I want to tell you just a small part of this. So plants have both mitochondria and chloroplasts, and usually they come out pretty simply when you do a pack bio assembly, they don't come out as well when you do an Illuma um, assembly, but you know, usually you can get them. They're pretty small. The chloroplast is usually about 150 KB. And in this case, um, in Macrocystis, um, the mitochondria is about 37 KB. So we did an Oxford run. We got extremely long reads, but um, this is just one flow cell. We got 10x of the genome. The genome is between six and eight. Um, since you we don't grow it in the lab, and I just collect it. There is a lot of variation, but this is one plant that we're working on, or uh, kelp. So um, we did one flow cell, and what I want to point out is that um, when you look at the alumina assembly, um, the chloroplast doesn't even come together. But the chloroplast comes together very easily um, with the minion reads. And actually, in this case, I think we had two reads that actually represented the, um, the chloroplast. Now, the mitochondria one, though, really got me sort of excited. And this is just an example of the kind of thing that you can do. And uh, we've seen a lot of talks about bacterial plasmids. Um, and this story is sort of similar, in a sense, in that um, we also got the mitochondria. And it assembled into these two weird fragments. And so I, I decided I was going to take a look at it a little bit more closely. Once again, it's 37 KB. So we actually had complete mitochondrial reads, uh, complete genomes sequenced. Um, so what I'm showing you is just the alignment of all the complete mitochondrial genomes. And then I just did a look at, well, you know, how are they related? And what you can see is that there's heteroplasmy in this mitochondrial genome. Well, one, a better way to think about it is I'm sequencing a very large plant, and there's probably lots of mitochondria in it um, that are changing. Uh, this ability to sequence a genome directly, so this is like getting a full chromosome, enables a whole new way of looking at genomes. In some of the other things that we've done in smaller genomes, uh, we are getting reads that suggest, well, in, in bacteria, we could get to whole genomes. Um, I, I learned something at this conference um, that I didn't know, which is that there is whale watching. And that's something that uh, 
we lo always look for the big reads, but I didn't know that other people, like there was a contest. <laughs> 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 um, so that's something, uh, we, we routinely do get very, very long reads um, because we don't shear. Um, so going to the question about shearing, we come out with these really long reads, but we get the very short reads as well. Um, and we use them all for assembly because they do actually, I find, um, when you just take the long reads, you don't end up getting the best assembly. The other thing that we've learned is that you could use all the reads for assembly, um, but you might not want to. So there is sort of a sweet spot as, you, as we're getting really long reads, we might need to go back to some of the calculations about coverage and length. Um, so something to think about. <clears throat> so um, of course, none of this work is possible without all the great people in the lab. Um, so I want to highlight Tim Motley and Shane Poplowski. They've done most of the development over the last three years that we've um, been running the Oxford. Um, and then my great collaborator, specifically Joe Ecker and Detlev Weigel, um, who this project uh, looking at Arabidopsis genomes uh, we're doing with. So with that, I'll take some questions. Were there any questions from the audience for Todd? Yes, there is one just down here. Pete. Oh, sorry. So have you tried using Canoe for your assemblies? Because that, that biases all of its assemblies towards the, the larger reads first and, and works down to a set coverage rather than trying to throw everything in. So the question is, have we tried Canoe for the assemblies? So I always run both. Um, and Canoe takes just a lot longer. Um, you know, Canoe is actually the preferred assembler at JCVI, and everybody wants, you know, to use it. What I what I found with the tDNA lines, I actually got better assemblies with Minimap. And when I say better, we were able to resolve the tDNA insertions better. Um, there are some issues associated with the assemblies of Minimap. With Arabidopsis, I found that they've actually been better than the Canu assemblies, but Canu actually really struggled with these repeat regions. Um, so it could be the version that I was using, um, and it could be um, that these repeat regions are just really hard. Um, but I, I actually, I love both assemblers. They're great. Any further questions from the group? So I look forward to your team getting engaged in the way of watching and seeing what comes of that. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I'll, once we thank you, I'll hand over to my colleague Stephen who will drive the discussion session for the next 15 minutes. So thanks, Todd. Thank you.